I know I'm bored, so I'll find new ways to start this. I should have lined up better. Like there. What? I'll work on it. Not that I think you really care, but it's empty. I got nothing. So, eh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nope. Come back, other way. Uh, a little bit. Up. 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 Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about. No, let me rephrase that. Today I'm going to talk about. You're going to watch at like 1.5 speed, which maybe if I talk slow. You'd hear my voice normally, but I'm not going to do that because, anyway. Uh, we're coming to the solar system. Uh, so, start off, uh, talk about our solar system. And again, we're going to use this as a comparison to other planets and systems as to how ours formed, which uh, we've actually found in, in recently recent-ish, that uh, our solar system is not that unique. And that seems to be how our solar system formed is probably how a lot of solar systems formed. And so not that unusual. Originally thought to be unusual, but the more we see, more we find, realize it's not that unusual. OK. So basically, we're going to go through the structure of the solar system. OK. And, and I'm going to go in a line here. So we're going to start with. The sun. Um, the sun, and, and we're going to have a whole lecture on just the sun, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details here. Um, but the sun is 99.9% .9 of all the stuff, of the solar system stuff. So the planet we're sitting on and all the other junk out of here is about uh, a tenth of a percent of the stuff that solar, the uh, sun makes up most of it. And so we're just a tiny bit of stuff that didn't get sucked into the sun and made the rest of this interesting bit. So it gives you an idea about how huge the, the sun is. Um, it is currently stable and it is fusing hydrogen into helium at its core. So that's what stable stars do. Get that more. So it's stable and it's about halfway through its life. So like me, it's about midway through. Actually, I'm probably a little over. Uh, anyway, okay. Uh, and um, it is slightly unusual in that it's alone. And use shoe wall, and that it is a loner. Um, I think slightly more than um, half the stars are gravitationally linked to another star. You have binary, uh, tertiary, or even large groups of stars. So, the little bit on Star Wars that are beginning in the first movie, best episode four, A New Hope, where Luke Skywalker goes out and there's two stars of Tatooine. That's not that unusual. So it's about uh, about as common as a single star. So that was actually kind of neat to know. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So not going to get into a whole bunch of detail about the sun. Um, it is a G two yellow dwarf size star. Um, it lives about ten billion years. It's about halfway through. So as stars go, it's a a decent, it has a decent, decent lifespan. So then we come out, you've got uh, you've got referred to as the inner solar system. Also referred to as terrestrial planets. Okay. 
Okay, so you got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and the Moon, and Mars. Okay, so those are the those are the planets. I'm not going to go over like the little thing about how you remember them, but those are uh, the planets. Now, I'm going to add before we talk specifically about these. These are grouped together, and these are unique, and that these are all share some similar um, characteristics because they differ from the other one. I've got a better marker here. That was a little better. So then you've got a gap. We'll get to what the gap is in a little bit. And then you've got the outer solar system. And that's made up of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, not to be confused with Uranus, <laughs> don't joke, and Neptune. Pluto, we'll get to in a minute. Pluto, in my opinion, rightly got voted off as a planet. It's not a planet. It is something different. So you have the outer solar system. These are referred to as Jovian planets. Hey, there is a big difference between the two of these planets, the two types of these planets. Okay, oh, and we're going to go distance-wise here. So the terrestrial planets, so from the sun, these go out to about, this goes out to about 1.5 AU. Okay, so distance from the sun, they stretch out to about 1.5 AU. This goes from about 3 AU out to about 30 AU. I got that. Actually, I think this is more like, ah, man, that's close enough. Maybe it's more like four. Okay. Okay. Big difference between these planets. Uh, these planets are small and rocky. Um, these planets are big and mostly gas. In fact, at, at one point, or they used to think that at the center of, of each one of these gassy planets was the core of like a, a uh, a small terrestrial planet, but now they think actually that anything gets in there gets pulverized into a gas, and these things are all basically gas planets. Um, so these are similar to each other, and these are more similar to each other. They're not very similar to each other. These are smaller. These are closer to the sun, making them hotter. They're mostly rock with very little atmosphere. Mercury has none. Venus has an atmosphere. That's, uh, I think, about 10 times bigger than ours. We have an extremely thin atmosphere, and Mars basically has none. It's a, a, a wisps of an atmosphere. And these are basically, if you want to think of them, all atmospheres. These two are referred to as the gas giants, and these are ice giants, these two. Because actually, these two are more similar. These two are kind of similar. It's some, if you want to. Similar composition, more similar to each other, more similar. These are called ice giants. They're farther away, and they're actually, um, the, the gases in their atmosphere actually uh, have ice crystals in them. And these are just all gas. These have more ice crystals because they're farther out. OK. Uh, I got my notes here. Okay, so the differences in between these planets. Here on planets, you've got your two groups. You got the terrestrial, and terrestrials are small, 
Rocky, Bot, uh, Bait. Make sure I get all my stuff in here. Uh, Rocky. Uh, uh, they have slow rotation. Um, no moons, except Earth. We've got one. We're the exception. Uh, Mars has two captured asteroids. That doesn't count. Um, really, that's just posing. Uh, no moons, from this was what we're saying. Uh, and thin, no atmosphere. The Jovian planets are kind of the opposite. They are large, gaseous, they are cooled, cold, they have a fast rotation. Um, Jupiter, Saturn rotate once every about 10 hours, so very quickly they spin around, or they're a whole lot, of, uh, a whole lot faster. Uh, they have lots of moons. Lots of oh, moons. Um, they uh, 60 and 50, and the two gas ones have like 20, so they've got lots of moons. Um, and they have rings, more importantly. So, okay. So, okay. So those are just kind of the comparison of, of the two. Now, why did this happen? Well. These planets being closer to the sun, uh, a whole lot hotter, any of the gases that they would have captured basically just got blown away. They were heated up, and the solar wind just heated them and, and blew them away. These forming farther out where it was colder were able to capture the gases. The gases didn't have as much energy, and so they could trap and collect it. And then you have kind of a, a snowballing thing. As these trap more gases and got bigger gravity, they could collect more. So this just kind of snowballed. The more you get, the more you can collect, the more you can collect, the more you can get on and on and on, and these grew. And these really didn't. They're too small. The gravity wasn't strong enough to hold the gases, and so these can't hold in light gases. They can only hold in some, like Earth can only hold in heavy gases, things like oxygen, which is heavier, or carbon dioxide or nitrogen, not light gases like hydrogen or helium. These could hold in all of them because they were much colder. So. Consequently, all you had here were rocks. The heavier elements would stay here. There's less of it, so you had smaller planets. And these out here could collect basically everything, gases, which are way more common. So they, they ended up having a lot of uh, gases. Okay, one thing that's interesting about these things is, so going to the sun here, the equator of the sun is also the plane of the solar system. And that all of the objects are basically on the same plane uh, or orbit around on the same plane as the equator or the rotational. This rotates like that. It rotates around its equator. These are all lined up with the equator. And so there are small variations on this. Some of these planets are tilted slightly off, a degree or two maybe up or below. Um, I think the worst one is Pluto, which is still not a planet. Um, it's, it's cocked more at an angle. Uh, I don't have that written down, so. Okay. The other thing, too, is if we look at the rotation of the planets, okay, so all the planets rotate basically the same direction as the sun. So they've got the same rotation. They all have basically the same, well, no, they all orbit in the same direction as the rotation. All these planets are sweeping in the same direction that the sun rotates around. So as the sun rotates around, all the planets go around in that same, revolve around in that same rotation. Now, they all rotate perpendicular, basically perpendicular to, except there are an exception. Venus rotates the other way. So whereas everything like Earth is rotating this way, Venus rotates the other way. 
And so what they think is its rotational axis got knocked 180 degrees. So it got hit. It was rotating the right way. It got hit. Now it's rotating the other way. The other exception is Uranus. And Uranus rotates almost 180 or 90 degrees on its side. So it basically looks like it rolls. Okay. So it almost looks like it rolls on its side. And Earth's got a tilt of 23 degrees. Mars got about the same sort of tilt. Everything is kind of the same, flipped upside down on its side. So they're off a little bit. And okay. So this is something also to consider when we look at you know the formation of all of this is to consider this this can't be coincidence that the uh the sun's rotation and the the equator extended out is the plane in which everything orbits and everything sweeps in the same direction so that is something to think about and we'll mention when we think about how this all formed the fact that this is all connected back together so okay we'll talk more about the individual planets in a later lecture um but that is uh, and so that is the kind of the overview of uh, the planets. So um, that they're all in the same plane, all move in the in the same direction, basically, except Venus and, and Mercury, and all yeah, the differences. These have got lots of I might be drawing in lots of different moons. Now that leaves what's this right here? This the asteroid belt. Now, if you look at the spacing out of this, and I don't do it accurately, but if you look at the spacing, this is a spacing where there should have been a planet. There is not a planet. There is a dwarf planet in here, so there is a little planet that's about, oh, let me look it up. I think it's about 400 miles, 600. It is 600 miles of diameter. Um, and this is Cirrus. It's the largest asteroid in there. It's actually considered a dwarf planet because it actually had enough mass to make itself spherical. So it was big enough that gravity was evening it out, made it a spherical mass, and so that's in there. The rest of it are just asteroids. Now, the asteroids should have formed a planet. They didn't because uh, Jupiter's gravity is interfering with it as it goes around. And ooh, I've got some we get, we get I got some, some good ones about the asteroids. Anyway, Jupiter's gravity interfered with the asteroids, and as Jupiter goes around, it stirs up the asteroids. So the asteroids were slowly gathering together. Jupiter comes around, its gravity pulls them apart, twists them all up, and then as they start to come together, it comes around. So the gravitational disturbance of Jupiter as it wings around keeps these from ever forming into a planet. And so they're just kind of floating around. And the biggest one we've got there is Ceres. And this is from about... Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could oh, you please repeat what you said? Shut up, Siri. Uh, this is two to three AUs where you find the asteroid belt. So. Okay. Okay. Asteroids are classified by their composition and position. Asteroids. So these are found between Mars and Jupiter. And it's a failed planet. because of Jupiter's gravity. Okay, messes everything up. So they couldn't come together. Uh, they're classified, asteroids are classified by their position and composition. So whether they are rocky or mostly metal, and then where they're located. And composition. Okay. 
So, um, you get a pointy stick. A pointy stick. And then come with me over to here. Oh, okay. That's a wicked blurry picture, but it's, it's kind of trying to show the, the sun, uh, the inner planets. You got an asteroid belt, outer planets, and then the rest of the stuff, but it doesn't show up well. Bang! There's an asteroid. Um, so as a typical asteroid, what's kind of interesting about this asteroid is it has another little asteroid that is uh, attached to it gravitationally, very, very weakly, because that asteroid does not have a whole lot of gravity, but it it has enough to hold that little thing there. Now, you could probably go and push it away and it would it would float away from that, though the gravity's not that strong. Um, but one of the interesting things about asteroids is they're basically really cold and covered with dust that's not very reflective, which makes them really hard to see. Because the only way that we can see asteroids is when they reflect off sunlight from the sun. So if we catch them just right and they reflect enough light, we can see them. But that can be really hard against the background of a whole lot of other stars. So you're looking out in the sky, there's a bunch of bright stars putting off more radiation. You're trying to pick up a rock that's giving off a little bit. That is another asteroid. So just to give you another picture of, of what they are. Uh, these do have the potential, possibly in the future, of uh, being mined for important metals. Um, so. You know, anybody who's watched sci-fi and talk about, you know, people going and mining uh, asteroids, yeah, that is, that is legit to do that. So, okay. So, this is showing, I did the scale, the um, uh, asteroid belt. So, the main belt between, so here's Jupiter and there's Mars. The main belt falls in here. But not all of the, the asteroids are found there. There are other major, I mean, there are other belts. There's the Amor belts. Now, the problem with this belt, as you can see, this comes out and it crosses over the orbit of Mars and it crosses over, oh no, it doesn't. It crosses over the orbit of Mars. So that has the potential of some of those actually colliding with Mars. The Apollos are the ones that we need to worry about because the Apollos actually cross the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Earth and into Venus, which is a problem for Venus, and then Atens do cross the orbit of Earth. Those all have the potential of containing asteroids that will strike Earth. Um, and if you don't have enough things to worry about, statistically speaking, we are due for an asteroid strike. When scientists have looked out at, at the past and seen how often we're hit, they happen, I don't know, something on the order of every 50,000 years. Well, I want to say we're at now something like 70,000 years. So we are past where the average uh, asteroid strike is. And the big problem then with asteroids is there's not a lot we're going to do about stopping an asteroid. If you want to stop an asteroid, what you would need to do is catch it way, way, way before it's going to hit Earth. You're not going to catch an asteroid that you realize is going to hit, it, hit Earth in a, in a week from now. The best that we could possibly do is if we realize that there's a, an asteroid out in the Apollos and maybe two years from now it's going to hit, we could launch a rocket out to it and then just nudge it. Nudge it in any sort of direction so that it wouldn't hit Earth. If we slowed it down, then when it was supposed to hit Earth, it would be uh, behind Earth, or we'd push it forward and it would pass us before we hit it, nudge it up, nudge it down, somehow. But the sooner in the, in the future you do that. Now, are we seriously doing anything to do that? No. We don't have any program to stop asteroids. We barely have a program to look at asteroid collisions. Um, that tends to be one of those things. It's too far in the future. It's somebody else's concern. So we're practically doing nothing about the potential of an asteroid strike. And an asteroid strike, if it were to hit, could have uh, human population ending uh, 
implications. But again, we're probably not going to do anything about it. So uh, anyway, I, yeah, I know. And I think it was in the news like last month that um, an, an asteroid shot between us and the moon and we didn't detect it until after it passed by. So it was one of those, whoop, oh, hey, saw that. We didn't know it was coming. And uh, in between the orbit of the moon and Earth is pretty close to us. Okay, so here's another thing. Um, there is also a, a large group of asteroids that is being uh, pulled around by Jupiter. And it's complicated physics, but these are stuck in what's called a Lagrange point. It's a point of equal gravitational pull. But between Jupiter and all the other things, this is a, a Lagrange point. So as Jupiter goes around, these are stuck in an orbit with it. So it has disrupted the main belt, and these have come out. And so these Trojan asteroids are kind of stuck going around the or orbit with Jupiter. So. Um, the other thing about the asteroid belt that would be really disappointing is the asteroids are about, you know, a thousand or more miles apart. So there's nothing like Star Wars or any of those space movies. Flying through our asteroid belt would be really easy. If you hit one, it's because you were drunk or are trying to hit one. So there's no scary, like, oh, my God, how am I going to get through it sort of thing. No. Yeah, I know. Not real exciting. Come on back. There we go. Okay. So they are also thousands of miles apart. Oh, and in case you're wondering, one of the stupider things to do with an asteroid would try to blow it up. Because um, the amount of explosive it would take to totally obliterate it, uh, we wouldn't have. And then even if you blew it up, you'd still have little bits. So blowing up an asteroid before it came to hit us would be the equivalent of deciding whether we want to get hit by a bullet or shotgun pellets. Um, and so instead of being hit by one big chunk, we'd be hit by lots of little pieces. So, I don't know, uh, not, a, not a good idea. Uh, okay. Uh, So, lots of different things. Okay, so, got those. Next section we've got going out here is, I, got, I know what it is. It is the Kuiper Belt. And so this is where you've got uh, you got the Kuiper belt. I like to think of this as the solar system's backyard where we park the car we plan to fix, throw in the spare parts, the lawnmower that doesn't work. It's our junkyard. Um, and this is out from 30 AU to uh, 100 AU. So this goes out to 100 AU. And what we've got here are dwarf planets. And short period comets. And by short period, those are comets that come around the solar system uh, relatively frequently. There are comets that come from farther out, but they might almost come one, uh, around the sun once every million or 10 million years. These come around maybe once every 100 or so years. And so they're shorter period. They come around more often. The farther out ones come around less. And so, yeah, we got a bunch of dwarf planets, one of which is a Pluto. So, uh, the problem with Pluto and why Pluto got demoted was the discovery of lots of other planets out where Pluto is. And so 
one of the considerations to being a planet is that you are basically alone in your orbit. You were the master of your own orbit. Um, and, you know, fitting the order. The, Pluto is a rocky planet, kind of like Earth and the terrestrials. It should be, it's more like this. It doesn't fit the pattern of being a big gas planet out here. Plus, it's not even the biggest one out here. Eris is the biggest dwarf planet. I think there's up to 30 now dwarf planets uh, out here. Um, and so what they think Pluto is and the rest of these are failed planetesimals. So they, when the solar system first started, you got the material started to clump together. And so you've got probably hundreds of, of like seeds of planets, starter planets. Some of those smashed together became bigger planets. Uh, some of them got flung out. Um, you know, so most of the planetesimals packed together and got the bigger ones, but Pluto, some of these other ones were flung out, but not far enough to leave the solar system and kind of gathered here as like spare parts and extra pieces parts. So the comets got trapped from farther out. So this is just kind of a junkyard. And so let's go back. Okay, so uh, here's the path of several of the uh, uh, dwarf planets. The other thing that's going against dwarf planets is their very erratic um, orbits. Um, you can see Eris, it's very, very elliptical, and it's not on the same plane. Um, so you got Pluto, Makimaki, Haumea, Eris, they're, they're all kind of synced up. Now, Pluto is actually in with a group of others, and I love this because it sounds like it would make a good band. Um, there's Pluto and the Plutinos. So the other dwarf planets that are kind of linked together with Pluto are called Plutinos. Um, Neptune actually has a big effect on these dwarf planets. The gravity of Neptune has kind of scooted them around and herds them, kind of like a sheepdog. So, Oh, that's a comment. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so here, Pluto's orbit at one point actually crosses uh, and gets closer than Neptune does in its, its orbit. I don't think there's any chance that the two of them will hit, but as you can see, it's an extremely elliptical orbit. So that doesn't help. Um, and there are a selection of the dwarf planets that we know about. I like this egg one. Why they didn't call this thing some sort of egg thing, I don't know. Oh, and Xena, the warrior princess. Uh, and, and a Quoar, which I have no idea what that one, where that name came from. So, but there's a lot of these, um, uh, ooh, and, and chaos. So, I guess that one must be a real pain. Uh, very hard to predict. I know, again, it's hard. It's an empty room. Killing me. So, okay, back. And here I am. Okay. So, uh, Kuiper Belt. It is uh, our junkyard, basically. We've got a bunch of different things. Okay, so then, make sure I get where I got, uh, my notes are jumbled up on this. Oh, there it is, you need to pause. So now, out to about 200 AU is the heliopause. The heliopause is the edge of the sun's bubble of gas going out. And why it varies from 100 to 200 AU. So inside here you've got the bubble of, because the sun is actually expelling quite a bit of gas, heating up and there's a bubble. So we're in the heliosphere for the bubble of gas. Um, I know it's still thin, it wouldn't feel like an atmosphere, you'd barely notice it, but it's uh, measurable enough to go out here. 
And the reason it's like that is because the sun is orbiting around the center of our galaxy, like we're orbiting around the sun. And as it orbits around in its motion, the bubble is actually stretched out. It's 100 in the direction of travel, because as it runs into material in the galaxy, it pushes the bubble here, and it's 200 behind it. So it's stretched out. It gets compressed as it goes through, and stretched out as it goes behind. So to our heliopause. So, and I want to say that uh, Voyager, the probe we launched in the 70s to go out of the solar system and explore, uh, they have both only recently just left the heliopause. So they're out into interstellar space. They are out of the, the, the gases and stuff for um, our solar system. So. Okay. The last part out from uh, the solar system, or the structure of the solar system, and this is going out to from 10,000 AU to 100,000 AU. A bunch of comets in a cloud called the Oort cloud. Now, we don't truly have any evidence of the Oort cloud. It's theorized. Uh, but this is where they think that comets come from. And so it's this big cloud surrounding uh, the solar system. Um, and comets, uh, and I'll get to show you the picture in a minute. Um, comets, they know, are extremely old, probably older than um, the sun, and would have formed before the sun actually turned on. So as the sun was forming, before it actually the, started to produce radiation, so as it was compressing into the sun, they formed. And the reason they know that is because the ices and the, the, the material that's in comets could only form in under, under extremely cold circumstances. And that would have been before the sun started to produce radiation. So it had to basically be in cold, empty space. So it must have formed first the comets that are out there, I guess, were the ones that were kind of pushed or blown away before they melted. Um, they also think the comets uh, are, are responsible for some of the water that we have on Earth, that we collided with them. How? I'm not exactly sure or when. But we go talk a little bit about comets. Okay. So, Oort cloud. This is what they actually think the shape of the Oort cloud looks like. So that, I mean, for some reason, the, the Oort cloud kind of comes in along the disk, uh, uh, but spreads out into a big sphere around, but it, I don't know, it has a connection around, uh, comes in closer around the disk. So, and there is a, another kind of representation in AUs, although that is in log of uh, uh, exponential form because that's only that's that's 10 AU 100 that's the, I know the same distance but it's uh, increasing yeah. it's not to scale which is weird so okay comments I gotta rearrange my pictures because they're not in order okay comments so with a comet you have the nucleus and that is the actual comet itself so the the um, uh, body of it, which is contains basically ices, so mostly water, but some other chemicals are in there. Uh, and then around it, like if you were to look at this as it comes close to the sun, it has something called the coma. And the coma is the uh, surrounding kind of atmosphere of the comet. It's evaporated gases. So as this is melting, it's the gases that kind of go around it. Um, and then you have even more uh, lighter gases make a hydrogen envelope around it. So this is kind of from the heavy waters, which have kind of like a cloud around it. As it goes to the sun, the radiation from the sun, so if this is the direction from the sun, the radiation from the sun melts and leaves uh, one tail, it's an ion tail, which is made up of smaller particles that uh, can actually be blown by um, the wind. And then you have a dust tail, which is heavier particles. Those dust tails 
are the particles that, that uh, comets leave that we run into that creates uh, meteors, in, uh, 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 meteor showers. So it's when we run into those. And the ion tail is always going to be pointing away from the sun, which leads to some kind of interesting things, which back here, where you can see here, so the nucleus, as it starts way out here, it begins to sublimate, so it's starting to get gases. As it comes in here, and it says here about 5, eight, five AU from the sun, it's going to start getting uh, gases uh, around the nucleus. Now, when it gets close enough and says, in this case, it's about Earth's distance, it's going to start to get a noticeable tail as the, the sun's radiation pushes it away. And you can notice that the tail then starts to, even though the comet is going in this direction, the tail is pointing away from the sun. It's actually moving with the tail kind of going in, it's going the same direction as its tail. So um, anyway, so that's the, the path. The path that comets takes are highly elliptical. And so this here might only take a couple months, but the rest of the trip here might take uh, tens of years. So in this case, here it whips around real quickly, but as it moves away from the sun, it slows way down and spends most of its time way out uh, away from the sun. Okay, so good. So, comets. You got trillions in the Oort cloud. They are basically uh, frozen ices and some dirt, dirty ice balls. Um, and they can be up to 100 miles in diameter. The other thing that's interesting, uh, that scientists find interesting about comets is that they contain organic chemicals. And uh, organic chemicals are chemicals that are formed of carbon. And they call them organic is because all living things on Earth have uh, carbon are based on uh, carbon molecules. And so they find that fascinating that there's organic com uh, compounds in them. And there is the thought that comets might have presented or kind of seeded Earth for life. They brought the, the complicated organic compounds that were necessary to build life. So they like to study them to see exactly what sort of uh, uh, compounds there are in these things. So. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Oh. <coughs> okay. So that goes through uh, the structure of the solar system. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is interesting is that the Earth's gravitational uh, pull goes out. So actually, you know, the last thing. 125,000 light years, I mean uh, AU, or actually two light years, is how far uh, the sun's gravity goes. So this is the edge of the sun's gravity. That's how far you'd have to go to actually escape uh, the sun's gravity. Outside of that, roughly, um, and you uh, are floating on your own. Inside that, you would eventually fall into the sun. That is a huge, huge. Uh, expands out uh, that the sun's uh, has a, an effect. Okay. Oh, last little bit. It's not actually a, a structure or, or meteoroids. And okay, so meteoroids meteoroids Okay, so there's meteors. Uh, 
gas when it's in our atmosphere. Uh, there's meteoroids. That's when they're in space. And then there's a meteorite. That's when it's hit the ground. I don't, I don't know why we have to have three different names for, for it. This is on ground. Uh, meteoroids is just, the, is, is just the, the general name for any space debris that, that hits the Earth. Uh, bigger than just an asteroid. I mean, I'm an asteroid, you know, it's an asteroid. But any of the small stuff, uh, most of it is rock. Most of it burns up before it hits the ground. Occasionally there are uh, meteorites that, that do hit the ground. The only ones that we're able to determine or find, collect, are metal ones. Um, because you can detect them with a metal detector, and then it's kind of easy by the composition of them. It's really hard to detect stone ones unless you've actually seen it fall down um, or know it fell down. So, and if you find them, they're worth a lot of money. So, um, yeah, 95% of them are stone. They're kind of rare that they are metal. So, okay. So, How did the solar system form? Okay. Formation. There it is. Okay. So, um, one of the things here is the you know, for again, for a theory now in science, you have to explain all the observations that you see. Um, so in coming up with a theory about how we got our solar system, you've got to explain all the things that we see about the solar system or all the different, you know, so any theory, explain all the evidence that you have. Um, so there's a lot of things going on with our solar system. One of the biggest ones is the fact that Everything's lined up on the same plane, and everything seems to be moving basically in the same direction. So they all seem to have been formed together and at the same time. And again, you're probably wondering, okay, how are we going to figure out how the solar system formed? Um, there's no record of it. There's no recording or, or whatnot. And nobody was around to actually see what happened. Well, in astronomy, like in a lot of sciences, you make observations of other things and then make uh, assumptions. And we have the ability to look out into the universe and see uh, other stars as they're forming and, and get an idea of like, okay, if that's how they're forming, there's a pretty good chance that how they're forming is how we're forming. So in looking how stars form, we have an idea of how our star formed. And what we then know is that stars form when you have a big gas cloud, like in hundreds of, uh, uh, I mean, thousands of, of light years across. So it's huge and it's very thin and very cold. Now, what we've also discovered about the universe is that everything, absolutely everything in the universe has a rotation or spin to it. Everything is spinning. There's nothing that isn't. So this gas cloud is gonna have a spin to it. Now it's super big, it's not gonna be spinning much. And this, you know, as it gets smaller and pulls its stuff in due to something called uh, the cons uh, conservation of angular momentum, it's going to spin faster. So out there farther, if you want to kind of think about it, it has to travel, I mean, kind of like it travels the, the same distance, the same speed. If it takes me, you know, uh, one hour to go, you know, a mile around, well, I bring it in here, I've got to go a mile in one hour, I'm going to have to go really fast to cover the same you know, mile distance if I'm in really close. So it's got kind of this, that, that same, same idea. So I pull it in, it's going to rotate much faster. So I got this big gas cloud. Over millions of years, gravity, the gravitational attraction of all the particles starts to pull it in. Now, the vast majority of it is going to be pulled into the center into a sphere, but if I have this, this sphere rotating, hey, 
Stuff that's collapsing in from the poles is not going to have any resist. There's no, not going to be any resistance. The stuff collapsing in where the, it's rotating is going to meet a centrifugal force pushing it out. And so here in the poles, this stuff will collapse easily. But there, because it's spinning, that stuff is also going to want to be flung out. So gravity is going to have to work a little harder. And what happens is I am going to collapse a lot of this into uh, a sphere, but I'm also going to get a disk of material that resisted that. And so basically due to this being a rotation, it's going to collapse it into a disk. And this helps explain why if the sun is rotating like this, why is there a, a why is everything kind of lined up at its waist? Is it rotational equator? No. And physics here explains it. So we've got this stuff. Now, so all of this collapsed, and this is what we do know. So the stuff collapsed down, and we had a disk formed out along its rotational uh, equator. Okay? How did the planets form, and how did, it, how did the rest of that stuff? Well, that is still being debated although there is a theory that, that is more prevalent. The first idea was that in that disk, so things collapse down. So in this, so you got the sun, you got this disk around, but then things started to clump together and you started to get you know, a planet form. And as that planet, I know I should probably get a darker marker. Uh, no, just a minute. This one is bad, or yeah, it's bad. so started to get a planet, and as this planet went around here, it started collecting all of the stuff in its way. It got bigger, and it kept going, collecting more stuff. It got bigger, and it went around until it kind of cleaned out a path around. So all of this stuff in its path, it cleared out, and it collected together. And that's what happened all the way out here. So there were zones in which planets cleared out all that stuff as they just went around. Kind of like a, rolling a snowball around a yard. Start up something little and it goes bigger and it just pulls up all the snow. You just roll around, it's collected it all. Um, that runs into a couple of problems with observations uh, that um, the planets wouldn't have, the bigger planets where they formed farther out from the solar system wouldn't have, wouldn't have gathered that much material. Um, Uranus and Neptune, where they are so far away right now, they, there wouldn't have been that much material for them to collect. So, and there's other issues with this. Um, and it doesn't explain why there are so many planets with huge pockmarks. There's, there's evidence that, that the formation of our solar system was way more chaotic. This seems a nice orderly fashion, but then where is all the stuff flying around? And in modeling, what they found is that no, you didn't get this nice collection of stuff. What you got instead was the sun formed in this disk around, and then you got little planets starting up. So stuff around it, like the stuff that got denser and collected into these little planetesimals. So you got these areas that all just started to clump. So as it moved around and started to clump, those things then started to move around and bump into each other and then sometimes smash into bigger pieces, sometimes collect. And then the whole process of forming planets was very, very chaotic, energetic things, smashing into other things. Sometimes they stuck and got bigger. Sometimes they broke apart. Um, and the evidence that, that, or the idea that the Earth formed because, I mean, the moon formed because the Earth got struck by one of these objects helps support that. The fact that the moon is covered by craters. Mercury is covered by craters. A lot of the moons of Jupiter are covered with craters. All these things were smashing into each other, building, and eventually more stuff stuck together than flew apart, 
And so you started to get these objects form and, and basically then you got bigger planets to form. Now, they think that, and this is what uh, modeling, you know, uh, computer modeling has shown, that all the planets form closer together. And as they got bigger, the gravity started to affect each of them and they started to move out. Um, and, and that the, the structure, uh, the, the interaction of the planets set them in the position they're in. And it has to do with their size. One of the things that's kind of interesting is that Jupiter and Saturn definitely affected each other because Jupiter goes around once around the sun for Saturn going around just a half perfectly. So what it is is Saturn goes around one time and Jupiter goes around exactly two times. And that's not a coincidence. That has to do with the, the size of each uh, of them and, the, and, a, and a resonance that they pushed each other out into those particular orbits. And those particular orbits are such that, you know, they're stable in that particular position. So um, anyway, so that's where we are in the theory of how the, uh, the universe forms is they think that, that material started to clump together. It formed in these planetesimals, these little protoplanets or starter planets. Those starter planets start slamming into each other. Material was flung out and that's how we got, you know, Pluto and whatnot out in the Kuiper belt and the material left over. And that um, the other planets then started to collect all the material. And eventually all of that material was either collected or flung out. And so there's very little of it now. The only thing we've kind of got left is the asteroid belt. So, but that asteroid belt is locked in place. So those are kind of some leftover pieces parts that were lined up and they're not, you know, free floating anymore on it. So, okay. So formation theory, uh, solar system formed from large gas cloud, sun and Saturn with uh, material this formed planets in big smash up. I'm not, I know, that's not technical. Uh, I'm getting tired. Uh, yeah, sorry. Low blood sugar, I mean at lunch. So, uh, okay, I think I got, yeah, I think I got it covered, so. I think that works. And I'm going to guess that you're not going to have any questions about this, because, my God, that was such a good explanation. You should put these things on YouTube, and everybody will be like, wow, that is the best explanation I have ever heard of astronomy. I have no questions. Toodles.